Welcome, traveler, to Folk Recovery, Ansley Simpson. And here is Ansley's story. Ani Bojo, uh, my name is Ansley Simpson, and I'm a Toronto musician, um, and I'm a member of Elderville First Nation. Um, yeah, that's me. I am folk because I feel it's the genre, I guess, that everyone puts me in. Um, I think when you start to play and speak and sing with a specific story or message um, that connects with people and with the community or with a specific community, uh, that's when you that's when you begin to represent what I feel is the original um, meaning of folk music. Uh, for me, the meaning behind folk music was to connect with communities and to have the voices of your community heard outside of that to be able to communicate and begin a conversation. I found folk through listening to music, anything I could find growing up in a very small town in the 90s. Um, and for me, the biggest band that influenced me initially was the Grateful Dead. I happened to be sort of lost when I was about 18 and, of course, went on tour um, following the Grateful Dead for the last summer that they were on tour. And, uh, you know, it was it was really amazing for me uh, as a kid to suddenly be exposed to all of these different lyric forward and music forward uh, performances. So from there, I think I started to look at songwriting in a different way. I was really challenged by the idea of being able to portray a story in a song and to communicate it in a way that still felt lyrical and something that you could find yourself singing. Um, so that was, I think, my original uh, pull to music. And I still feel like you can hear some of those influences in my music today. I love the harmonies. I love just letting my band um, perform and come up with things. Um, yeah, and it's it's sort of uh, where I go to, I think, in, uh, instinctively uh, when I begin writing. And I think for me, I when I started to really listen to Indigenous performers from dating back to the 70s, 80s, so Willie Dunn, Annalise Obamzawin uh, really influenced me because her one album, which is beautiful, if you can listen to it, it's called Bush Lady. She incorporates storytelling and uh, really fine instrumentation that sounds really intimate and, I don't know, very real. Um, so being able to, to listen to the music of other Indigenous artists that really broke the ground for uh, musicians of my generation and then the next generation. I'm seeing incredible musicians today, Indigenous musicians that are just doing things that um, just seem to come so naturally. Uh, they don't feel like they have to define themselves as musicians that happen to be Indigenous. They don't struggle with like any any issues around what they're saying they just confidently get up there and speak and for me I'm really inspired from that as well as a songwriter when I'm starting the process of writing the song I actually have a visual image of what's unfolding inside my mind and I kind of follow myself along with my pen and paper and capture down the images that I'm seeing or experiencing in the song. So for a song like uh, Quay, um, uh, what I was doing that was off my first album, Breakwall. Um, yeah, it's Quay changing into Thunderbird. And uh, I start off at the top of this area outside of Goderich called Black's Point which was a local spot I would go to in high school. And you have to start to get down to the beach. You have to go down this dark cedar lined rickety staircase that goes down the escarpment, basically right to the, to the shore. And in that image gathering phase, I was able to kind of pull out references and 
images that I could then fold into something that sounded more lyrical. That song in particular, I jump around in time quite a bit because when I wrote it, I just left um, uh, my the father of my child, my partner, and I was trying to put the pieces back together in my own life. And I remember walking to the art gallery and sitting in front of my favorite Norville Morriso series, Man Turning into Thunderbird. And I started writing in front of those paintings, which is a series of, I think it's six, it might be seven, I can't remember. But, and I remember thinking, oh my goodness, like, that's me right now. I am fundamentally changing, but I'm not passively turning. Like, it's not just, woo, beautiful, one day I'm turning into this new, I'm changing, like I'm willing it. So for me, it was more, gritty and hard. And I began to look at my entire life and try and find the pieces of what really represented me. So for that song, it's an incredibly personal one. Um, I start off at that point in Black's Point where I really, we'd play guitar down at the beach. That's where I really connected to being able to, you know, play around other people um, and sort of share music in that way. And then it jumps to uh, a period later in my life where this uh, farmhouse outside of Markdale, Ontario, where a friends of mine would go to, which I mentioned, I lost a lot of friends um, tragically through different experiences. And that's a really hard point in my life because I didn't get any time to process it. So it's really hard for me to go back and try and find myself. But I wanted to have those friends in there and those moments in there because they're so intimate and they're so connected to who I am as a person today, I can immediately taste, you know, the metal of rain hitting the back of a pickup truck from different memories. So I embedded that into the song. Uh, yeah. So there's, I, I, it's funny. I often wonder how people respond to that song or what they hear from it, because for me, it, the, the red thread that runs through it spans decades. It takes place in numerous places around, you know, Ontario anyway, or my territory. Uh, yeah, so I love when people love that song. Um, absolutely love singing it live too. So that's always a bonus. And I think at the, at the end of the songwriting process, if you have a song that you can sing, first of all, because it took me a lot of times to be able to sing that without crying, which is fine. You just got to get through that part and then enjoy it and like be inspired by it when I'm on stage. To me, that's a success in a world where we kind of measure success by likes and shares and streams and listens. For me, it's when I can get myself to this point of going, okay, yeah, that's, that's good. That felt good. And then see the audience or listeners respond in a really positive way too. I see folk recovery here in Canada as a way for the for musicians to connect in a way with audiences and with listeners that feels really genuine. It feels more like sharing experiences and songs and I don't know life the way that life is. Uh, so much of our lives I feel are really influenced by like algorithms and, you know, a screen. And uh, when I look at my 11 year old kid who is embedded in that world to some degree, I often wonder what her connection to community is going to feel like, you know, what is our connection to community? If we, if we completely disconnect from people, who are we left with? Um, and so what I'm trying to do in my own personal life as an, and as an artist is to make genuine connections with other musicians and with audiences in a um, back and forth kind of way so that it feels collaborative. It feels like there's life there and tangibility and that it can exist outside of the circles of, you know, podcasts and um, even performances or just listening to a streaming album. So for me, that's where folk recovery really comes in to play. It feels like it's recovery. My final share with you, Traveler, is to really look at how you are engaging with the art around you. So this means the music that you're listening to, 
uh, the, the art and music that you're creating uh, and to, to actively engage in it. Um, there is so many opportunities in, uh, in my life and in my day-to-day -day experience, and I feel like I'm not alone with this, to just disconnect from what's going on around us. And when we do go online, there can feel like this onslaught of, of um, just difficult things because the world is a complex and difficult place to be in right now. And so I really want people to access and experience art and music as a way to sort of affirm life and positivity in that sense where it is in our control to feel a little bit better at times. Even if we don't have any other supports, we can put on music, we can feel a little bit better maybe, or feel less alone in our sadness. Plenty of sad songs out there. Um, but to engage in art in a really conscious way. Um, and I feel like everyone gets something more out of that experience. Uh, so yeah deep dive, deep listen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Traveler, for joining us on this Folk Recovery Oral History production created by guest storytellers with contributions from Gaytree Killings, ASL performer and advisor, Joni Narita, folk community advisor and sound producer, Karen Young, technical producer, Stephanie Williams, assistant producer, Alyssa Matthews, Station Manager at CJRU 1280 AM. Allison Skirm, Special Collections and Liaison Librarian at Toronto Metropolitan University Libraries. Heather Hewitt, Folk Recovery Logo Designer, as well as Senior Artwork Specialist and Yogi. And special thanks to our friends, family, and community supporters, and to our funder, the Ontario Arts Council. I am Kijo Buchanan, narrator and executive producer. Ashe.